Hi there, thanks for joining me for another episode of Draw, Make, and Code, and in this episode, I wanted to make an iris, the procedural art that creates the iris of an eye. And I, if you think about the problem a little bit from a procedural generative art perspective, you can imagine that it's basically a line that just moves around. So if you're going to draw a cartoon eye, you might draw a big round dot and fill it in black for the pupil. And then to draw the iris, you might just draw rays, lines coming away from the center going to the outside. But if you ever looked at a picture of an eyeball, you'll see that's a little bit more than that, that they're not straight lines. They're like waves of tissue that move from the pupil outward. And those tissues can contract and expand, and that's what makes your pupil get bigger and smaller. So if we're going to replicate this procedurally, instead of drawing just a line going from the center to the outside, we might want to draw a wavy line. So if, if you've looked at the P5JS example page, you know that there's a 2D, 2D wave there. There's the program to draw a line that's a wave. So that part of it's done for you pretty much already. What the next part of that is to, instead of just making one wave again and again on the screen and refreshing the page, draw that line and then rotate it a little bit around the center and then just keep doing that and just don't refresh the page, just accumulate that output. So this is an example of that happening behind me here. And you can see that's precisely what's happening here. So let's look at this output. This is the program we're gonna make. This is the output that I'm hoping to produce with this program and I'm gonna go through it line by line with you. There are, you can see two things kind of going around. There's one that's colored that's going around. There's another one that's black that's going around the other way. So two different line forms. And where they overlap, you can see they're like almost perfectly matched. So we're basically getting the outline of a line sometimes and sometimes not because the length of each line is different. It's almost the reflection. I think it's kind of sort of the reflection. And I'll show you how all of this is done here. And you can stylize this in lots of different ways once you learn how these pieces are put together. When I started this, it was just really simple. One line going around, it made the iris. It was kind of eh. So I like, uh, let's change the colors and let's have it another one go around so we can get some textural differences. And once you start applying the concepts of art, <laughs> then you can play around with this code and get something that looks pretty cool. I think this looks pretty cool. Let me know what you think in the comments if, if this is, looks like an iris or not. So in the description, you'll find the, this program complete with annotations. So it'll describe what each line is doing, basically. And if you just want to jump into it, there you go. Have a great day. <laughs> Have fun. But if you, if you want to learn more about what it is, if maybe you're not so sure about what's going on, let's go through it line by line. I'll explain it to you. And then you'll know what you can change and how that change is going to affect the program. So go to your P5JS editor and start a new sketch. In the Create Canvas, we're going to set the canvas size to the available width and the available height. We can do that with these words here, Window Width. You'll see it turns pink when it's a keyword. Window Height. Now P5JS knows what you're available. So if you're looking at this on a mobile device or a tablet or your desktop, it's going to give you the available window width that's there. If, if you're trying to make sure that this looks good on everything, I usually, as a rule of thumb, I try to make things uh, coordinated to the height because I figure people are going to maybe looking at it on a, a tablet or if it's on their phone, they're going to turn it to landscape mode or if it's the desktop, it's going to be landscape mode. So of those dimensions, you have your height, which is smaller than your width. And if I made, if I made things set to the width, then most of it's going to be off the screen by the height dimension. So I kind of want to constrain whatever is inside the canvas to that smaller dimension of height. So you'll see me do that a lot as a, as kind of a, a matter of convention. In the global space, so up here, outside of setup, outside of draw, we need to declare a variable that we're going to use throughout our program that's going to hold the object, this wave, this line. So we're going to have a, some procedures that are going to make a line, but it's going to make a line as a wave. And we want those procedures to be contained all nice and neatly in a variable so then we can access parts of those objects using that variable. So I'm going to call that variable shape. And I'm just declaring it for now. I'm not going to assign it yet. I'm going to do that in setup. Down here in setup, I'm going to take that variable shape and I'm going to set it equal to an object. So if, if you want to set a variable equal to some kind of object or container of things, whether it's a function or a class, you're going to use a keyword, this declarative keyword here called new. And then now, now P5JS is expecting a function. It's, it's expecting some kind of object, a class or a function. 
we're going to imagine that the name of this function that we're going to create that makes waves, I'm going to call it waver. So that's kind of easy to remember. And waver, because it's a function or a class, it can have values that are sent into it. It can accept variables from its declaration. We don't have anything going into this to start. So this parameter, there's nothing inside here. We're accumulating the output on our canvas. That basically means that each frame we're not clearing the canvas and starting with fresh output. We're leaving what was there the last frame and then we're just printing over the top of it. I want to start out with a clean canvas to begin with. So if, if, I, if I never use background, it's going to use the default color as the background, which is gray usually. And I want it to be black to begin with. So I'm going to set background in setup to black and then I'm not going to use it again here in draw. So in draw where there's background automatically put there, we're just going to manually take that out. So inside draw, I want to do this thing where it prints the output, the accumulated output, but then after so long, it, it kind of gets noisy and built up. And maybe at that point, I want to start with fresh output, but I want to have to prompt it to do that. I want it to do it on its own. So one of the ways that you can do that is just have a counter and then check the counter and see, see when it's past a certain point, reset that counter, clear the screen. We could do it that way, or we could look at the frame count. And every time the frame count is a group of a certain number so if it's a multiple of something then we'll clear the screen there's a couple ways that you can do that and this one this is kind of a sidebar to help out if you if you need this mechanism in your code so one of the ways that you can do it is have a condition and use the keyword frame count and that's going to return whatever frame you're on as the program is running through draw so how many times has it been through draw that's what this is going to return if we use um, let's the the classic way here's the classic way we're going to take frame count and we're going to divide it by a number. And this will be, if, if we want the refresh, if we want to clear the screen pretty frequently, we'll say that this number is 100. So every time frame count equals 100 or 200 or 300 or 400, a multiple of 100, then something's going to happen. So if frame count divided by 100, if it's an even number, then it's going to be the integer of frame count divided by 100. This is a classic way that you do it. You take whatever multiple you're looking for in that incrementer, in that accumulator, you're dividing the accumulator by that, that factor, and then you're testing that, uh, that difference. Is it a difference? That quotient, you're checking that against the integer value of the same operation. And if it's an even number, then you know that it's an even amount of that. If it's a fractional amount, it'll have a decimal left over, and then this condition isn't going to be true. That's the classical way of doing it, and it's kind of wordy. Even explaining it's kind of a lot. There's an easier way to do that. You can use frame count again, but instead of using all that divided by and equals the integer of, we're going to use this symbol here, the percentage symbol, and this is called the modulus. And then we can use the modulus value here, which becomes the factor that computes if this is an even multiple. So this will be zero. This is going to be a decimal. It will return a decimal, which will be the, I think it's the remainder. I'm not sure. But if, if this isn't evenly divisible, there's going to be a remainder. There's going to be a decimal value. If that decimal value is zero, then there's no remainder. So if the modulus of frame count is true, if the statement is true, then that's going to equal zero. I hope that made some sense at all, that it was worth, <laughs> worth explaining it. So there's a couple ways that you can do it, and this is probably the easiest and fastest way to do it, so long as you understand what's going on. Inside that condition, if the frame count is a multiple of 500, then we're going to clear the screen, is all that statement says there. 500 is pretty good. My computer speed is about like um, maybe 50 frames a second, somewhere in around there. So about a count of a second, you've gone through 50 frames. So if I set this to 50, it would clear after about a second or so, give or take. So I'm setting it to 500. That's going to refresh pretty fast. So in about 10 seconds, it will refresh. That's not going to give you a lot of accumulated output. So we may set this up to maybe 1,000 or 2,500 or something like that later on. But if, if we set it up as high as we want it to go, then we have to wait forever to test it to see if that works. So set it low to begin with. If it works, then set it as high as you need it to be. After we've tested the condition whether or not we want to clear the screen, this run through draw, now we're ready to look at the object, the shape object. 
and perform the calculations that we need to, to do, and then maybe show that output as well. And we can do that all inside the function. So we're going to take that shape variable that's holding the object, and we're going to look inside that object, and we're going to find something called make. Now, it's not there yet, but it will be. We have to be sure to put this in our function. So we're going to imagine the function that we make that's called waiver up here. We called that function waiver. Inside that function, there is another function, a method called make. So we're calling that method f from the object contained by this variable, or held by this variable. So once we, we do that, it's going to do all the stuff in make. And then it's going to come back, and ideally inside make, it's going to have all the output. So the output is there now. Over the top of that output, we're going to drop down our pupil. Because right now it's just drawing waves from the center, and they have jaggedy edges. It doesn't have a clean edge because this is going to be moving toward and away from and shrinking, and it's just not going to be a regular shape in the center. So to compensate, I'm just going to draw a circle over the top of the center, and that's going to be our pupil. And I'll fill that circle with black, and I'll out outline it with some close to black color so that it has kind of a little bit of a, a rim. To do that, let's isolate any of the changes that we make to the stroke weight and the stroke color inside push and pop. We're going to change our stroke to a dark, like black, really close to black, full intensity. And we're going to set our stroke weight to 5, and that's going to be the outside of the pupil. We're going to fill that with, uh, two fifth, with a really, really black color. So this is the, the rim color, which is a dark, dark gray, close to black. And then the inside of the eye will be, may as well be black, but not quite. It's going to just be a couple notches off of it. Why just a little bit? I don't know. That's just the way that I put it, and it seemed to work, and why change it? So now let's draw that circle. We're going to draw it at the center, which is half the width, half the height. And how big do we want that circle to be? Well, this is uh, where I want that height dimension because it's the smallest, and then that will make sure most of our eye is inside the screen. So to get half of the height, we're just going to multiply it times 0 0.5. But I want it to be uh, the pupil. I don't want it to cover up the complete iris. So I actually want the iris to be a percentage of that half of the, the circle size. So something around 35% uh, of the height, or 35% of our circle. I think, it didn't, did I set it? To, oh, I haven't set it yet. I haven't set that yet. So next, I want, on the very outside of the iris, I want those edges to be clean at some point. So if it, the, if the, the weaving that makes the iris, if it makes it to the outside edge of the iris, I want it to be finely shaved off so that it makes a perfect circle around the iris. And then if it doesn't make it in quite there, then it can be jaggedy or whatever on the inside. But if it makes it so far, I want it to be nice and smooth like the outside of the iris. To do that, I'm going to print another circle. This one is going to have a really hefty line on the outside. So it's going to be, it's not going to have any fill. And the stroke weight is going to be real hefty because I want to cover, I want the thickness of that line to cover the full distance that the iris piece may move past. So I, I don't want there to be my ring that's covering up the edge, like a mask to make a smooth edge. And then every once in a while, the iris will go past the mask. And now I'm, I have like this blank gap and then iris pieces on the outside that look like hair. I don't want that. So I have to make this stroke weight heavy enough so that it will cover all the possibilities of that iris moving past the rim, but not so far past the outside. So 100 should do it. I want the stroke to be full intensity black. Don't ask me why I use three zeros there. You can just use one if you like. And uh, let's drop that circle down at the same position in the center. But now let's make the, the size of that uh, the full height plus a quarter of the height. And that should make a good cover for the outside of the eye, and it's in proportion to the pupil, and everything looks cool. So once that's done, I can close the graphics attribute container with that pop. So I have a push and a matching pop. And that's the end of, I think that's the end of draw. So if I run this now, I'm going to have an error because I haven't created this function yet. So that's what we need to do. We need to create the function next. So in setup, I set to the variable shape a new instance of the function waver, W-A-V-E-R. So I'm maintaining that consistency here. This word matches the one that I used up in setup. Inside that function, I'm going to have another function called this.make. So that's a method that we're going to use to actually generate the output 
for this wave. In the, the, um, the main part of this function, we need to declare some variables to start. We're going to need some position variables. We can assign those to zero, but as soon as we start, uh, the make part is going to reassign. So it's going to get some initial variables here, but those are going to get changed. So basically zero here is just a placeholder for a value that will go inside this variable. We need one for X and Y, and because we're making a wave, we need an offset for our noise function. So I'm going to assign that to zero, and that's the Y value in this noise function. The X value we're going to get from a loop. We need a size for our, our line. So our line's going to be sized in a couple different ways, and this might get confusing down the line, so I'm going to explain it to begin with so that it's easier to follow along. So I'm drawing my line not as like the beginning point to the end point. That's the line, basically one segment. Instead, my line is going to be made up of lots of smaller segments that are linked together by um, a different Y coordinate. So it looks like a wave. So if you can imagine, you have like a bunch of yardsticks taped together, and where they're taped together, we're going to lift that point up or down. And that's if we do that randomly or pseudo randomly with a noise wave, then we're going to get this neat little pattern. So we have the variable of the length of the line itself, all of those segments together. What is the sum of that? And then we have the variable for how big is a segment. So if we have a large segments, then we're going to have fewer segments per the length of the line. And if we have small segments, we're going to have lots of these pieces per the segment or per the length of the line. So as we change the length of our line, we can adjust, we can have that as a variable adjustment and we can change the segment length too. That's a variable adjustment. And if we tie those all into the same noise values, and those are tied to how things are rotating around, you get like these multiple relationships in how the patterns are being generated. And that's where it starts to look more organic, like it's being built instead of just randomly generated. So S is going to hold the size of our line. And then we're going to have another variable that's going to hold the, the segment value because both of those are going to be variable. Oh, and forget everything I just told you because <laughs> and that's great. I just read my notes. I knew it was something like that. Okay, S. S is the height of the wave. I should have named my variables better, probably. S is the size of the wave. How tall is this wave? It can be uh, below the line by 50 or above the line by 50. And by line, I mean, let's say the line is sea level and then you're pulling up on that, those segments of the yardstick are pushing them down into the water or ground or whatever. So positive values are going to be above the line and negative values are going to be below the line. And that distance above or below is going to be a maximum of 50. And then the length of the line is going to be a, a fraction of the height. So 75% of the height. So our wave line that's moving around is going to be 75% of the height as it moves around and it's displaced from the center a little bit. So some of this iris is going to be hanging off of the edge of the screen. And you can play around with that a little bit, but I think I messed around with the proportions and I kind of like this, these ratios the best. Because we're rotating this line around the center, we need a variable to handle that angle, those radians, and we're dealing in radians of pi. So I'm going to use theta to hold that value and I'm going to set the initial state of that to zero. I need a variable that has a velocity for how fast this moves around. So basically we're going to be incrementing theta by this value here. And if we wanted to move things forward and backward like an oscillation, then we could just multiply this times negative one whenever we reach the different parts of that oscillation, the different nodes. We need variables to hold our colors. I, found, I thought it would be interesting to change the colors as it goes around. Maybe there's some trigger, it completes a full circle and that triggers a change in color. And as one color increments and reaches a, a threshold, it's reset, and then it triggers a movement in the next color, and so on and so forth. So the colors are kind of like a speedometer, like the miles, the ones place is moving, and then once the ones place rolls over, the tens place moves o rolls around, and then once the tens, tens place rolls over, the hundreds place moves around. That's how the colors are working here. So we're going to assign these initially to random values. And I'm going to just use integers here. We're going to do R, G, B. 
inside our function we have this make part and that's where all the business is going to happen and the very first part of that business is assigning to a local variable our x offset so we're going to use this for our noise variable and in 2d noise the parameters inside the noise method there's an x and a y value and if you're not familiar with these i would recommend going to the examples the example page of the p5js website and playing around with the 2d noise program and getting a feel for how changing the, the values is going to affect the outcome of this wave it's really sensitive to how you set things up so the x offset in this case it resets every time i create a wave i'm starting with the same x value so my noise wave is kind of anchored to this zero and then anything any noise values that come off of it because of the y or the z is going to be relational a little bit because they're anchored to this value that never changes or it changes uniformly across whatever you're doing so the the beginning of the noise value i want that x value to be zero and then i'm going to increment the x value inside my loop so i'm basically using my loop kind of as an incrementer which i could do that i don't really need the x offset i could just use the a factor of the the loop value so whatever the loop the for loop is returning i can just use that multiply it times a fraction that's going to give me a little a really small number to move my noise by the problem with that is if you're manipulating this loop like the length of the loop is going to be changing because you're taking different size segments of it that's going to affect how that wave incrementer moves uh, and the factors of it are going to change and so if you just have it changing by the same increment each time instead of being a floating one or a variable one it's going to look more relational so that's what we're doing here we're going to use this x value here so the height of our wave that's kind of a, a 1d noise so we, we can use the return of 1d noise and we just map it to a set of uh, to a range and then use that for the size of our wave so one way we can do that is uh, we're going to use our variable this.s that we declared up there and we're going to use the map method inside map we're going to use the noise method and inside noise <laughs> we're going to use frame count and a fraction of it 0 0.01 we're going to be kind of consistent this way because we want everything to be relational so the return of the noise so this method right here is going to return a value between 0 and 1 so we're going to put those in the range parameters of the map method and then we're going to map that range to the second set of values starting with 10 and ending in 75 so if the return is 0 then this dot s is going to equal 10 if the return of noise is 1 then this dot s is going to equal 75 and any decimal in between is going to be interpolated to any decimal or any number in between 10 and 75 so our wave height can be as small as 10 or as big as 75 and that's going to be the range throughout the line so it's not going to have like maybe a segment of the line is limited to 5 or 10 and maybe a segment of the line is limited to 75 so like they're all going to be limited to the same amount throughout the length of the line and then when the next line is made the the wave part is going to be a different value we want to advance the radian that we're rotating this wave around the the pupil so we're going to use our variable theta and we're just going to add to it that incrementer value this dot ts let's check theta and see if it's reached a certain point and if it has then let's do something so basically if we, our wave has moved all the way around the pupil it's completed one iris we'll say and then maybe i want the color to change and then the next layer of iris goes over the top of that and the next layer and so forth and then it's just going to build up an iris over time so if theta is has made it all the way around one time so theta goes from zero to one that number whatever it is i'm just going to multiply that times two pi and that's going to give me a full circle when it's one and it's going to be at the very beginning of that circle when it's zero so if this dot theta equals one or if it's greater than one then i've made a complete turn around the pupil in that case i want to set theta back to zero which will kind of leave it in the same position because the end of a circle is the beginning of the next circle right and while I'm while I'm in this condition while this condition is true I want to change the color of things so I'm going to call another method inside this function 
and that's called colorer. So I'm going to run this part, and it's going to give me some new colors. Now it doesn't exist. I'm going to make that up here in a little bit, but let's imagine that it exists. And now uh, we've completed one iris. We are going to the function that changes colors. It changes colors. Now we're coming back and we're making the iris again. So to make our iris, we're still inside that make function. So we're on the there's the bracket for the make function. Let's go inside of it. And we're going to do the push and pop to isolate any changes that we make to the graphics attributes. So we're creating a container for changing the graphics attributes. And we are going to change those. We're going to translate to the width and the height. We're going to make that our origin. So now when we refer to the center of the screen, we're going to use 0, 0, 0x zero and 0y. Zero and any change from 0 and 0, 0, any changes from there, positive ones are going to go to the right or down, and negative ones are going to go to the left or up. Once we've translated, we're ready to rotate. So we're going to take 2 pi, which is a full circle. Pi is the unit value for a circle, which is actually half a circle. And if you multiply half circle times 2, you get a full circle. So 2 pi is actually a complete circle, and pi in itself is just a semicircle. If we take 2 pi, that, there's a keyword for that, and we multiply it times theta, this dot theta, which is a value between 0 and 1, we're going to get a fraction of pi. So it's actually making its way around the circle in these small fractions of pi. Let's set the stroke to the color that we've grabbed from the color or function. And we're going to use the variables that we assigned in the main part of the function. And let's make the alpha be kind of low. And you can set that up. And matter of fact, let's set that high for now just so for testing. And then you can drop it down and get whatever cool effects that you want. The stroke weight for this first object is going to be pretty big, a 7. So let me explain what we're, we're making. We have, remember from the beginning, we have two objects that we're making. We're making one wave going in one direction that's colored, and we're making another wave that goes in the other direction that's black. And they will overlap to create a wave that's black on the inside and outlined on the outside. So to do that, we want the bottom wave to be colored, and we want it to be a little bit bigger than the top wave part. And when they overlap, that difference, that overhang, is going to be the outline. We're drawing a shape, so we're going to use a shape map uh, or a shape table. We're going to use the keyword begin shape and end shape, and we're going to use the keyword vertex. So whenever you have begin shape and end shape and you use vertex inside, what you're basically saying is, hey, P5JS, keep a list of these coordinates I'm going to give you through this keyword vertex. and keep, a track of, keep track of those in order. And then at the end, when I say end shape, draw whatever shape that makes. And P5JS is going to treat it as a shape, as if it were a circle or a square or a triangle. And you can fill that. You can outline its stroke, even if it's irregular. So this wave is going to have these um, planes associated with it that are irregular shaped. It will basically amount to triangles kind of hanging off the line this way and that way. We don't want those to show up. So what we have to do is turn the fill off. So we're going to say no fill, and it's just going to draw the stroke, which will be the line of that wave. So inside that push and pop still, we've set all of our conditions. Now we're ready to begin our shape. So to set up our shape table, we're just going to use the keyword begin shape. And when we use the keyword end shape, when P5 encounters this, it's going to draw that shape. It's going to look at the shape table. It's going to put all of those vertexes, vertices together. And then it's going to apply the fill if it needs to be. And it's going to apply the stroke in the way that it has to be applied, given the way that the shape table was given to P5JS. And these vertices are drawn in order or in sequence. And you can add multiple vertices to each pass inside the begin shape and end shape. Typically what you would do is you'd have a loop that connects all of these vertices in whatever looping sort of way, iterative way. Or you can just mechanically, just manually take each vertex and assign those coordinates and just have a thousand of them in sequence, one after the other. And then when end shape is drawn, it will go through and recall that table and bam, draw your shape for you. So at the end of the, oh, nope, not end shape. So let's open up that a little bit. Inside begin shape, we need our size of the, the segments. I think this is the size of the segments. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, so we're using a local variable, let se, and we're gonna map that to the noise again. We're gonna use this noise function. We're gonna use frame count again. 
and we're going to multiply that times 0. I think it's just 0, 1. We can play around with that if you want. That's going to return again. That's going to return a, a value between 0 and 1, and we're going to map that to uh, 10, a minimum of 10, and a maximum of the length that we set up there in the, the global part of this function. So this is going to use noise to control the length of the line. And this is going to give us that patchy shape as it makes its way around. It's not going to be perfectly circular. It's going to have like these torn looking edges, this irregularity. When we create a line, we're making segments. And to segment a line, you need to know how far do you go before you cut it, and then go that distance again, cut it again, go that distance, cut it again. Well, the distance that we go before the next segment that can be variable. We can change that each time we make a line in this wave. And we can have that be not random, but pseudo-random, tied to noise, and be relational to how it's being rotated around, so that we get this, this multiplicity in the relationship between these shapes. So I'm going to create a local variable called our gap, and this is our rotation, our, our segment gap, based on the rotation. And again, we're going to assign this to, uh, we're going to map this to the noise of frame count. We're going to take a fraction of that, which will be 0 0.01. The return is going to be 0 or 1, and we're going to uh, interpolate that to a minimum of 3 or a maximum of 15. So our segments are going to be 3 pixels to 15 pixels in length, and then there's going to be however many segments of that it takes to create the length of line that's defined by this random value, or the pseudo-random value up here. So now we can do our loop. We're going to create a loop we're going to call it x, and we're going to set it equal to 0. So what we're doing is we're drawing a line from 0 out to the right a certain ways, or positive x a certain ways. And because we're translating or we're changing the coordinate system, we can still draw this the same way each time in the math. So we can go from 0 to a positive x value however far out. We can change the y as we go every step of the way and create this wave. And we can do that the same each time. But if we want it to be repositioned around the center, we don't have to change that math at all. All we have to do is rotate the coordinate system so that when we print that, when we output that same math to the canvas, it's going to be dropped down where it needs to be. So we're basically in the math drawing it to the coordinate system that we all know and love. And then we're taking that coordinate system as kind of an overlay and rotating it onto our canvas. And we're doing that for each time we go through and produce a wave. The net effect is we can make a wave from zero to whatever, and we don't have to worry about performing the matrix, see, the matrix rotations on these, the polynomials, the quadratics. We don't have to worry about any of that. We're just doing this simple math, and then P5JS is going to do everything else for us as it rotates the coordinate system. So our loop is going to go from zero, or that center point that we're imagining we're rotating around, and it's going to go the length of whatever we determined it was going to be with that local variable SZ. And we're going to increment X by that local variable R gap. So we're getting a lot of variety in how this line is being produced as a wave. Inside our, our loop, we need to create our, uh, our noise by changing the y position according to the pseudo-randomness of this noise function. So we're going to set this.y to the map of another noise function. This time, we're going to use 2D noise. So in the x position of that noise function, or the first parameter, we're going to use our local variable x off. We've set this to 0 at the beginning of our loop. And then now that we're inside our loop, we're going to be incrementing that x offset value. At the same time, outside of our loop, we're going to be incrementing the y offset value. And the overall effect will be these relational waves that um, are similar to one another as we go around the iris. So the x off goes there. The variable uh, this dot y off goes in the second parameter. It's going to return a number between 0 and 1, like always. And we're going to set that equal to um, negative this dot s and this dot s. So that's the size of our wave, remember? And it can be below the line that size or above the line that size. Uh, okay, I think that's, that's it for that variable. So now we have our x position from this, uh, this loop, because we're looping through the segments of our line. That's giving our, us our x position. And then we have our, our y position for those coordinates where those segments meet. Let's draw the vertex, or let's send to the shape table the coordinate so we can draw this line whenever we get to the end shape. So in vertex, that's the keyword for assigning a, a coordinate to the shape table. You can use curved vertex as well, but it's a little bit more complicated. 
the first parameter is going to be that loop variable. The second parameter is going to be the return of the map of the noise. Once we've done that, we can increment our x parameter. This number is going to control how that shape is being made over time. I think it's I think that's actually one of the if you graph this, one of the the lines is time <laughs> and the other one is like the change over. Either way, whichever one you change, increase or decrease, it's going to make the line smoother or more mountainous, and it's going to make those changes occur faster or slower. And you can work that out. For now, I just like these settings because they're kind of the default ones and it gives you a good, a good movement to the noise. So once we've advanced our X offset, we can end that loop. So we're outside of that loop now. Once that loop has ended, we can end the shape and draw the wave that it produces. Um, is that what I wanted to do? Yes, push. Okay, I had a lot of stuff going on down there. Don't pay attention to it. Okay, so we're ending the shape and we're ending the container, the push and pop that's holding the changes to the graphics attributes. We're ending that as well. So that's the first or the first line that's going around the colored one or the bottom layer of this output. So now we need the top layer of this output or the black line that's going around in the other direction. So we're going to isolate those just like we did before inside push and pop. And we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We can just use what we have already and then change a little bit of the parameters. So everything inside push and pop, we're just going to copy that. We're going to go down to our second set of push and pop and copy that inside there. Paste it inside. So we have a couple red lines. We'll take care of those here in just a second. So we're going to translate to the same location. And if you want, you can rotate this line around in the same direction. But if you want it to go the other way, we're just going to put a negative sign in that rotate parameters. So now the this value is increasing in the negative direction instead of increasing in the positive direction. It's going to make a line go around the other way. Our stroke, we want it to be zero. So we're making a black line or whatever your background color is. We're making negative space or removing some of that color so that we can get this delimiter between the colors and it's going to make this neat texture. We want the stroke weight to be a little bit smaller by at least one or two. Usually two creates a good outline. And we don't want this filled, so I, don't, I think we're okay there. We'll just leave it there. And now we've got our begin shape. Now we've declared this variable already. And we can use the same one if we want, or we can get a different set for this side. I'm just going to get a different set since it's here. So to do that, um, we're just going to change that variable. We're not going to declare it again. So we're going to take the let away. So now it's just a, a regular assignment instead of declaration. We're going to do the same thing for our gap. We're going to take that let away. If we don't, we're going to get an error that says that this variable has already been declared. So we're, we're just going to take that out. In fact, I think we can, let's just take this one out too. Let's just get rid of that. So we're only going to change this value here. If you want to maybe erase that and see what it does, if it makes any huge change. So I think that's it for that. So typically what we would do is we would advance our Y offset right here and then go back into the loop. But we're doing this twice instead of once. So we want to print sort of the same wave over the top of the other one so they kind of overlap nicely. So I'm not going to advance the Y offset there. Otherwise, I'm going to get a different set of noise values in the second layer. So I'm going to wait until I get down past the second layer. Then I'm going to advance my Y offset by maybe uh, one one hundredth. Is that a tenth? One tenth? No, that's one one hundredth. Okay. And I think that's all of that. So inside the, the function, we're still inside the function. We've moved outside of the make method of that function. If we highlight this bracket here and go up, we can see that this is still the waiver function. So we're inside the waiver function still. We want to create another function. Remember, we want to change the color. So we need a, a method for that. And we're going to create that right here by setting this.color equal to a function. We don't need to pass any parameters into that because we're still inside the main function. We can use the variables that were declared in the main part of this function. So we're basically going to use those. We're going to use uh, this.r, this.g, and this.b. We're going to advance r first. You can put these in any order and increment them by any value you want. It's kind of arbitrary. I'm doing 24 just because. So as soon as you advance one, you want to check to see if it's out of bounds. So we've advanced the red channel. We're going to check the red channel to see if it's out of bounds. If it is, we're going to reset that channel to zero, and we're going to advance the next channel. This dot green equals 24. 
and then because we're advancing a channel we need to check it this dot g is greater than 255 if it is let's set it to zero so we're resetting it and we're advancing the last channel which is blue and since we're advancing a channel we have to check it for bounds and if it's out of bounds let's reset it there's no more channels to change and that's all we need so at the bottom of those conditions so highlight the bracket to make sure we're at the outside of that whole mess of conditions let's just change the stroke right now so we're going to change this dot r this dot g and this dot b and let's make them full intensity why not just for now we can change it later so if we've done everything correctly this possibly should maybe work and it looks like it does let's give it some time to see if it clears after 500 was it 500 yep see now it's cleared you can up this maybe double that time to a thousand and you can see the lines the strokes are being created on full intensity let's let them go the same direction and see what happens so where we put negative down there in the second layer let's change that back to a positive now they should both be moving around at the same time pretty much in the same place now because the these factors are off just a little bit things aren't going to line up perfectly which is cool because it makes a nice little pattern let's change that back and where our stroke says 255 on the black we're going to leave it that way we want the black to be taken away full intensity but the colored section we want that to be a little bit lighter so down here where I have the color changing let's change that to um, 50 maybe let's see what happens I don't think that's going to work down there I don't know why I'm changing it down there okay this isn't doing anything and <laughs> you don't have to have this here all right that's it that's the end of this one that seemed to take a lot longer than I wanted to I'll probably do this again now that I've done a couple dry runs but man the output on that is really amazing what do you think of that let's look at it closer love that output in another version of this I made the pupil move around so the the center of the screen the origin is fixed here you can see it's fixed there and uh, yeah and draw what you can do is make some 2d noise that handles the X and Y location on the screen set that to really slow so that it doesn't change fast and then just translate the center that you're drawing everything around to that noise location and it'll make the eye look like it's moving slowly around the screen you have to do it slowly because you need to give the eye time to build up its iris enough to be definitive and since it's moving really slowly it's actually kind of creepy <laughs> all right I think that's it for this video let me know what you think give me a thumbs up if you like this leave a comment and if you have some suggestions I'm open to hearing those if you're not subscribed yet please do I'd be honored to have your subscription if you are subscribed thank you so much I hope I'm not disappointing hit the bell to be notified in case you've missed some of these videos I was on vacation last week that's why you didn't see any uploads but I'm back full time again and I don't see another vacation happening for some time so uh, I'm gonna have content every week you can find tutorials demonstrations highlights all kinds of stuff on my channel so check that out as well and I guess that's it thank you so much for watching and until next time take care